As consumers, we're not always aware of what goes into our food and how it has been produced. But behind what we eat are millions of farmers and an entire industry. And access to safe and healthy products varies from one country to another. In this episode, we are joined by the founder of an Indian startup working to raise awareness and access to sustainable and nutritious food in her community. Stay with us as we dive deeper into soilless farming in India and this founder's path to entrepreneurship. Hello, everyone. You're listening to Her Voice, a podcast from The Choice, the media powered by ESCP Business School and dedicated to decision makers. My name is Lara. And I'm Emily. And we're from The Choice's editorial team. Her Voice is guided by one really important mission, to give the mic to women experts whose vision have transcended the competitive world of business, shaking things up for the better. Today, we are joined by Anisha Goel, an ESCP alumna and co-founder of Kaze Living, a startup intent on changing the food game in India. When confronted with the difficulty of finding fresh, quality produce in her hometown, Anisha decided to be the solution. Kaze Living is a farm-to-fork venture that provides people with pesticide-free, locally produced products. The firm also partners with hydroponic farmers to cultivate their fruits and vegetables. What is hydroponics exactly? Don't worry, Anisha will explain it to us. Hello, Anisha. Thank you for joining us today. We would like to learn more about the woman behind the voice. Could you tell us the story of how you decided to move back to India and start Kazi Living? Hi, really happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So to tell you guys a little bit about myself, I grew up in the countryside in the northern part of India. A big part of my formative years were spent in the far north of the country. My family at the time uh, had been running businesses in floriculture and horticulture and organic farming. So even as a teenager, I was very sensitized to modern farming techniques, to following good agricultural practices and mindful consumption. I was exposed to uh, a lot of the malpractices uh, in Indian agriculture at a very early age. Uh, I was sensitized to the extent to which we consume excessive chemicals and pesticides on a daily basis in India, the toll that it takes uh, on our bodies. In 2015, I decided to move back to India and actually started my career with uh, strategy consulting. I spent a couple of years uh, in the Delhi office of Arthur D. Little. And after that, I moved to the South in Bangalore uh, to work at a tech startup. I wanted, I figured that, you know, that's where the innovation is, that's where uh, the future is. And I sort of wanted to be on the front line of that. So actually within a few months of moving to Bangalore, I was quite sure that I would want to be an entrepreneur at some point myself. So the first time that the idea of Kaze Living came to my mind is when I was actually at a cafe and I noticed that the waiter was uh, sprinkling some microgreens on our salads. Um, so anyway, I saw him, he came over to the table, uh, snipped a little bit of uh, the microgreens right in front of us and then sprinkled it on our salad. And it struck me that actually, um, we don't have any place where we can reliably and safely uh, buy greens and berries in the country, even today. Uh, even in the premium supermarkets, there's very little transparency on where your food comes from. Has it been grown safely? Uh, and this is really crucial, especially for foods that you're likely to eat raw, like those you put on a salad, um, because you actually have no way of cooking them and getting rid of any uh, excessive chemicals or pesticide residue that it might have. I had been aware of, uh, you know, a lot of modern farming techniques, including hydroponic farming for quite some time. And uh, I knew uh, of uh, the benefits that they have and uh, both in terms of like sustainability for the environment and the benefits for, the, for, for us, uh, basically. And uh, that's when I thought that, okay, I think we should just bring it to market and make it more accessible to people. Well, that's super interesting how you got a business idea from a salad. <laughs> <laughs> Love the story. We wanted to ask you, what does Kaze mean in Kaze living? <laughs> Uh, so Kaze actually means breeze in Japanese. The reason we came up with this name was because 
we were talking about what to name this company at a Japanese restaurant called Kaze. Uh, <laughs> and it just appealed to everyone aesthetically. Uh, and it just seemed to work. Having said that, we also had a few practical constraints in mind. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to look at is, of course, that the name is not taken. And uh, I wanted the name to not be a common word in English or Hindi so that our SEO uh, down the line is easier. Uh, and we also wanted the URL to be easily available and not find ourselves in a situation where uh, we have started the company and then we're either having to change it, change the name or buy a very expensive URL uh, from someone who already owns it. That's how we ended up with uh, Kaze Living. Hmm. Very interesting. It seems like you get your best ideas at uh, restaurants and cafes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And extremely practical to think right off the bat about your SEO, uh, your search engine optimization and your URL. But practical advice that I'm sure is extremely useful to other yeah, people looking people, for their big idea. <laughs> yeah, who are starting a, a business. That's really interesting to think about that right from the start. So why was it hard for you to find these fresh fruits and vegetables uh, back home in India? When I moved back to India, I was a very active customer of e-grocery apps like Big Basket. I was doing my daily chores on the app uh, and overall found that the experience was pretty good, but there were definitely some missing links, right? The first thing that I realized is, especially when it comes to uh, products which are extremely perishable, my experience was almost never good. So we knew that our initial target is going to be uh, the affluent middle class in India. And we realized that as consumers, they consu they have a multi-cuisine uh, consumption pattern, right? So they'll probably switch it up and they'll have Indian and then they'll go for European, Mediterranean, Asian, uh, whatever they fancy. But when it comes to cooking at home, they actually tend to stick to uh, only their traditional cooking and they don't experiment much uh, or they don't know how. And at the end, cooking becomes a chore versus like a pleasant, fun activity to do in the house. And, uh, and, that's, and that's, that was striking to me because that is something that can be changed. With a population of 1.3 billion, India is the second most populated country in the world. According to the United Nations, almost 70% of India's rural household depend on agriculture for the living. With climate change and population growth challenging the production capacities of farmers in India and around the world, thinking about new ways to grow food in a healthy and sustainable manner has become crucial to feeding present and future populations. As you were mentioning before, you come from a really interesting background. You know, your parents were in this field. You even grew up maybe not something you loved as a little kid, but being, you know, aware of the foods you were eating and like the consequences, for example, on pesticides, on your own health. I'm wondering, is that awareness raising an aspect of what you're doing, helping other people in your community understand, you know, the impact of pesticides or that they do have other choices? in terms of healthy yeah. produce. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, that's what we wanted to do. More than just selling uh, groceries online, we wanted to tell stories, uh, make the customer understand and be aware of how their food is being produced, where it's coming from, and how is it actually reaching their plate. This is something that we realized uh, was a problem for the producers and the farmers as well. We've often heard that increased use of pesticides, for example, can be linked um, and be a consequence of climate change just because there are, you know, more pests in the field. You know, farmers have more challenges in, in ensuring their crop production. I'm curious in your community and what you're seeing in the industry, how climate change is having an impact. And you're absolutely right. There are many aspects to climate change, uh, global warming and land desertification being one of them. But uh, climate change is actually happening through a lot of micro problems as well. And uh, excessive pesticide and agrochemical use is definitely one of the ways uh, that contributes to this and contributes to land degradation and desertification overall. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, as of today, uh, I think of all the sectors in which, uh, you know, uh, service and manufacturing, which India has done fairly well over the years. Unfortunately, I think agriculture is work in progress. Could you tell us a little bit more about the specific challenges that the Indian ecosystem and infrastructure faces and a little bit about how you've dealt with those through Kaze Living and also how the pandemic impacted your own supply chain? Yeah, absolutely. The Indian agri supply chain infrastructure was fragile to begin with before COVID-19. There is over 35% of fresh produce that gets wasted. And the farm to fork duration can be over 60 hours. That leads to a significant nutritional loss and perishability. What COVID did was, of course, exaggerate the issue simply because of the lockdown impositions and the highways were getting shut. There were additional and checkpoints required for road travel. So uh, it basically, you know, uh, created a lot of havoc in the on an already existing fragile uh, supply chain. I, w- I do want to add here that there has been a lot of progress to tackle this over the past years. There have been very successful tech startups in the recent years that have raised uh, millions and millions of dollars in funding uh, that are targeted towards solving for this problem. They digitize the agri supply chain. They onboard the farmers directly onto their platforms. They bring about uh, some amount of transparency in the pricing and eventually give uh, a better realization to the farmers and reduce the time uh, lapse between the harvest and uh, the time that the food arrives on the plate. So you started your company in 2019 and launched, you know, a couple months before the global pandemic hit. What were some of the impacts on your business? How did you survive this last year? Uh, Yeah, so... uh, after we started, we launched in mid Jan 2020, and uh, pandemic hit basically in March. I mean, in some ways, actually, it was uh, a blessing for us for two reasons. First is that people were looking; a lot of people who had not moved online as a habit for grocery purchases, who were uh, primarily purchasing groceries offline, uh, started to move online for their grocery purchases because they didn't have an option and. Secondly, everyone suddenly became more conscious about what they're eating and, you know, how to how to stay healthy and how to avoid how, how to how to improve your immune system. On the other hand, the supply side and the, the food manufacturing sector, as well as the farming sector, was suffering during COVID and they found themselves just suddenly unable to transport anything and suddenly unable to uh, get their hands on the necessary ingredients or the raw materials required for uh, farming or food manufacturing. And what we were trying to do was basically just solve the operational challenges, uh, you know, make sure that the products reach the market on time. Uh, They don't get stuck with, uh, you know, um, on state highways uh, because of lockdown regulations. So we frankly had a lot of firefighting to do uh, within the second month of mm-hmm. launching Kaze that we de- never expected. I think I found myself in some local police stations getting the COVID passes made uh, for the first time in my life. And believe me, Indian police station is not a site anyone should be seeing <laughs> if they're lucky. <laughs> When we look at the stories that you're telling from Kaze Living, you are working with one type of farmer in particular, farmers uh, who use hydroponics to grow their fruits and vegetables. And I was wondering if you could tell us the story of hydroponics. Simply put, hydroponic farming basically stands for growing crops in water instead of soil. So there's no soil involved. Uh, Water is the primary medium that is used to grow these crops. There are a few benefits to hydroponic farming. In fact, uh, it's often touted by scientists as sort of the holy grail and the absolutely sustainable future of farming. The reason for that is, first is that the it's not dependent on the fertility of the soil itself, which means that you can grow crops locally in any climate, in cold deserts, in hot deserts, in the Arctic, if you wish. So uh, it doesn't depend on 
uh, fertile land, which is a scarce commodity in the world as of now, um, and will be in the future as climate change creeps up on us and uh, scientists are predicting a lot of land uh, desertification. Uh, the second is uh, it also uses very little of the other scarce resource that we have, which is fresh water. Uh, so most hydroponic farming techniques will recirculate nutrient rich water and actually end up using only about one to two percent of the water that's used in traditional farming. They absorb them from water uh, where uh, the nutrients that they need are pre-mixed. So it's basically a pure water which has been enriched with all the nutrients that a plant needs. And the most important, I think, in the Indian context is that when there's no soil, there are no pests, there are no little uh, bugs and insects that you need to kill, which means that there are no pesticides and chemicals, in, chemicals involved. As long as you can grow it in a secure environment without any bugs or pests coming in, you don't need to add any pesticides or chemicals to this uh, purified water. Well, wow, it's interesting to understand like yeah, more clearly how it works. But I know, for example, I mean, we had a hydroponic system in South Carolina where I was living that I got to visit once. And it's really beautiful almost to see like the water flow in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is actually. And it's quite striking because the whole farm is actually floating. It's not on the ground. So it's just sort of in, uh, you know, th there are different techniques. It can be in big buckets or it can be stacked up on top of each other or it can be just a single uh, horizontal layer of uh, basically food grade PVC pipes through which you have running water, which mm -hmm. gets recirculated. Uh, but you don't need the soil. So it's actually, you know, uh, floating above the ground. So it takes less space than a traditional farm. It could be an ideal way to grow crops in a your urban farm. Okay. Exactly. So it's perfect for growing crops very close to the cities. Uh, and that's, that's why also uh, greens and berries are the first things that people are growing using this technique because these are extremely perishable products, uh, even a few hours in the heat and they start to wilt. So it makes sense to try and grow them within the city and just consume them within uh, small urban clusters. So it takes uh, a lot less land, especially when you stack it up on top, and which is basically what uh, they call uh, vertical farming. India is the world's largest producer, consumer and importer of pulses. Think beans and lentils and the largest producer of milk. But farming is not only about the soil and the crops. It is also about the humans caring for the earth and for people. Today, India counts more than 100 million farmers. Anisha, you talked about how some of the consumers you gained during the pandemic were some of your most faithful consumers now. I was wondering how uh, has Kaze Living been received by farmers? Have you faced any challenging in reaching these farmers and other stakeholders? When we were getting started, I started by visiting a lot of hydroponic farms around India, uh, understanding the farming techniques that they're using, visiting their farms, and understanding their business model. Uh, what I realized is that a lot of these farms were struggling to uh, stay afloat, uh, despite having state-of-the-art facilities, um, they are often they often have balance sheets in the red and that's primarily because it's difficult for them to access the markets as small farmers they may not have a team uh, that can help them uh, manage multiple online and offline retail channels and also mark their produce the differentiation of their produce uh, the consumers are also not aware of what hydroponic farming is in fact uh, I think I have spoken to hundreds of my customers personally, and uh, I don't think more than 5% of them had actually knew what hydroponic farming is. Uh, and that creates a challenge for them because uh, when they're not able to differentiate their product, uh, they end up competing on prices and selling their produce in bulk below the market rates because this is a highly perishable product. What we want to do is you know, help them tell their story. Like people should know what differentiates their product. People should know that right in their backyard, in their own city, there are these second gen farmers who've taken a leap of faith, built 
uh, these amazing farms and they're growing produce that's absolutely chemicals and pesticides free. Uh, one of the first few farms that I visited was uh, actually uh, this farm called the Berman Farms. And uh, we visited them and we saw uh, the experimental work that they were doing. Uh, and what was amazing was that these guys were not just, they hadn't just set up your run-of-the-mill hydroponic farm. They had actually been working towards some very uh, frugal innovation techniques that help them uh, reduce the cost and make these products very accessible. Uh, so I found that really inspiring. And after we went and visited them, uh, we asked them that, okay, you know, we have a few customers. And that time we had just launched the website like a, a week back. So we had had our first few orders. And we asked them that, okay, we would love to, you know, ask our customers to actually come and visit you and see for themselves what you guys are doing. And they were happy to let us do that. So we organized like a little farm tour for our customers. Everyone loved it. That's great to be able to see firsthand, you know, how what something you consume is made. I can only imagine if we could do that for clothing, for mm -hmm. pretty much everything we use, how it might be, it would change our, our, the way we consume. So that's a really interesting story. <laughs> A master in management from ESCP, several posts at consultancy, experiences in financial services, and even car and bike rentals, as you told us. Among all of these experiences, what's the most important lesson you've carried with you from then until now? And how have these experiences prepared you for starting your own company? Um, yeah, I mean, um, it's it's been quite a it's been quite a diverse journey and uh, I'm really ha glad that I had these experiences before I started my entrepreneurial journey. Uh, I think it just opened my mind to dealing with different uh, people and uh, just building out relationships. And I think that is one of the most important lessons that I learned through my journey with Kaze as well. Uh, the first thing is that, you know, your your core team, the people that you work with, your founding team is extremely important. I cannot stress this enough, but uh, you need to start with someone that you trust. You need to start with someone that you can understand because things and who's as motivated as you as well, because things do get difficult uh, and things do get frustrating as you move along the journey. And uh, it's important to, you know, have one less problem to worry about. And that's, you know, your trust and your understanding with your co-founder. How did you find the people you founded uh, Kaze Living with? Uh, so I actually started uh, Kazi Living with uh, my co-founder Shruti. Uh, I have known her. She's uh, she's my brother's partner and uh, I've known her for many years. I knew just when I wanted to start Kazi Living, I knew she would be the perfect person to work with. What were some of the other priorities in, in terms of people you needed to, to take along the journey with you? In terms of building the core team, uh, I think... Uh, the first thing that we realized is, you know, we need team members who have skills that are complementary to ours. So essentially skills that you don't have, right? You need people who are really motivated uh, to do this, you know, someone who actually enjoys it. So the first thing that I looked for is, would you really enjoy doing this? If you don't enjoy doing this, if it, sooner or later, you know, it's not going to work out. My role as a founder eventually was just to keep the entire team motivated and make sure, you know, we give them the right environment to let them do what they do best and work well together with each other uh, and I think on that front you know uh, we did do quite well we've had uh, very little attrition since we started and there is a great deal of autonomy on everyone and now as we enter the growth stage of our company uh, I guess the challenge moving forward would be uh, to hire people slightly more senior than you know what we have today and the challenge with that is you know as as young founders you would often have to hire people whose skills who who are way more overqualified than you are right whose skill set is goes well beyond you so how do you do that how do you uh how do you assess someone whose skill set is beyond yours and how do you understand their limitations and how do you ensure that you know you are uh, people managing them while they are managing your company for you right and I think anyone who can strike that balance between that sort of humility, but also 
keeping pushing pushing the team because the founder set the pace of the company that much uh, i think is true the pace at which you work is the pace at which the company will move forward so how do you maintain that pace and uh, from your team while also maintaining the humility of those that are overqualified uh, or not overqualified more quali- way more qualified than you are uh, so i think you know this is some these are some of the problems that i think about today as we enter the growth stage and uh, i think every entrepreneur would think about at some point in their journey yeah you mentioned as the founder um having to maintain that motivation and and strike that right balance and i feel like you among other entrepreneurs this last year you know were added additional challenges to that maintaining that motivation i was wondering if you had any advice on how you managed to keep up the pace for yourself and keep your team moving so some of the best practices that we follow i would say is uh, one is a uh, all team weekly catch up right and uh, i think that's really important with uh, zoom videos on and uh, you know no no one was really used to working remotely full time uh, so that added extra pressure on the team you know in terms of ease of collaboration so i think just uh, sort of having those weekly catch ups with everyone with uh, video on so that you know you relate to each other face to face yeah and i think just a very open communication and constant feedback we are a very small team uh, right now uh, we're about uh, 10 people it's important to make sure that you know everyone feels uh, like this is one small family and everyone feels personally vest- vested in the growth of the company to conclude our episode if you could give any advice to others who are also looking to find their voice uh I, my advice be to just uh, start somewhere start speaking i mean um i had a lot of inhibitions everyone does and especially we started with a company which does which is a marketplace for food and farming and we didn't know much about marketplaces or about farming i mean i think uh if you ask uh help will always come i i would i would suggest people to you know be active on social media be active on linkedin speak to people speak to founders and um somewhere along the way you realize that oh you know what maybe some people do want to listen to what i have to say and and then you just talk some more so yeah i would just say start somewhere and then just don't stop thank you well we enjoyed listening to you <laughs> yes we were we wanted to hear what you had to say <laughs> yeah No it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much Thank you all for listening The whole team of Voice hopes you have enjoyed exploring sustainable farming in India with Anisha Gol If you think her voice is food for thought should reach more people click the subscribe button and give it 5 stars on your favorite podcast app Thanks for listening